This is intimidating. <laughs> so, um, we actually have a little bit of a streak going, you all may not realize. Um, last week, um, Joyce had talked about what it was like growing up in Belize, and I'm here to speak on behalf of growing up in another foreign country, a place called Alabama. <laughs> But um, all jokes aside, you all, those of you who um, know your pilgrim history might know, um, I'm not the first person from Tuskegee to stand here. Because back in 1908, Booker T. Washington spoke here at Pilgrim. Now, I, I looked, I've not been able to find uh, the text of his message, um, any sort of news reports about it, but to kind of put his visit, put, to, put, to put Booker T. Washington's um, Visit to Pilgrim in perspective, seven years earlier, in 1901, Pilgrim, which back then was still called First Congregational Church, hosted the annual meeting of the American Missionary Association. And at that meeting, part of the, the official statement of the AMA was that it, it officially endorsed uh, Booker T. Washington's recent dinner with President Teddy Roosevelt at the White House. Earlier that year, in 1901, Booker T. Washington had, had dinner with President Roosevelt White House. And one speaker here at Pilgrim at the AMA meeting said, quote, We rejoice in the courage of our chief magistrate, who receives at the executive mansion of this nation a distinguished son of our African citizenship, who is also an apostle of the principles for which I am speaking. So we congratulate the president on his courage for having dinner with a black guy at the White House, basically. <laughs> And we can laugh about this in 2018, maybe, but the word courage was actually not misplaced when they used it back in 1901. Because this dinner had sparked a great deal of outrage around the country. Let me give you some examples of this, and I will warn you that there's some coarse language in this. Not mine, but I'm, um, as many people who sort of follow politics today know, um, when the person you're talking about uses horrible language, you have to use horrible language too sometimes. So, after Washington had this dinner with President Roosevelt at the White House, one unnamed author in Missouri wrote a poem called, quote, Niggers in the White House, which was reprinted around the country and sarcastically proposed that since, Washington, that since Roosevelt had invited Washington to dinner, that Washington and Roosevelt's daughter should get married. Senator Ben Tillman of South Carolina declared, quote, the action of President Roosevelt in entertaining that nigger will necessitate our killing a thousand niggers in the South before they will learn their place again. The governor of Mississippi, James Vardman, said, quote, I am just as much opposed to Booker T. Washington as a voter as I am to the coconut-headed, chocolate-colored, typical little coon who blacks my shoes every morning. Neither is fit to perform the supreme function of citizenship. There was so much controversy that the White House itself was compelled to make sure everyone knew that none of Roosevelt's female relatives had been at the dinner. And we had Washington there, but don't worry, no white women were there with him. No one saw fit to point out the irony that Washington himself was the child of a former slave and the white man who had sexually assaulted her. Meanwhile, another black activist named Monroe Trotter, who was more progressive than Booker T. Washington in pretty much every way, criticized Washington for attending this dinner even as he publicly supported social segregation between blacks and whites. So, some things clearly have changed in the more than 100 years since Pilgrim hosted Booker T. Washington and officially praised him and the president for having dinner together. On the other hand, some things have not. And I was also asked to sort of use the past to reflect on the future. Some things, of course, will change, and only God knows how and when, but other things, you know, are not, unfortunately, going to change anytime soon. So on the one hand, we have recently had a black president living in the White House. Just eating there, but living there. And we currently have other black politicians who have legitimate aspirations to pursue that position, maybe in 2020, maybe beyond, it, beyond that or to seek other political posts in the near future. Not just seek it, not just aspirations, but legitimate ones, as in it's not possible. On the other hand, the first black president was succeeded by a man whose political career began by questioning whether or not Obama was entitled by his birth to even be president, who had first become famous in the 1980s for calling 
by calling for the execution of black men accused of raping a white woman, even after they were put in a court of law. Who has called for physical and economic retaliation against those who oppose him, protesters, football players who won't stand for the national anthem, and his vision of what America should be. Who defends neo-Confederate protesters even after they surround a black church with torches and mow down counter-protesters with a car who refers to the entire African continent and Caribbean countries as, I can't say this in church, I'm sorry, believe whole countries. My, my grandmother's watching me, I don't, I don't care if I said it. <laughs> I don't need to have a visit in my dreams, believe whole countries. And who continues to support, the support, who continues to enjoy the support of more than one third of the United States population in spite of these wars and actions, and for some people because of these wars and actions. We still have the idea that African Americans have, quote unquote, a place, and that those who do not stay in their place should be punished. We still have legal and extra legal violence against African Americans, especially young African American males, as I was reminded last week when the Oak Park police put out a bulletin that they were looking for a tall, light skinned black male, and I was afraid to walk my dog that day. And I was that glad that my son was staying with his mother that day because I did not want to get pulled over or have my neighbors call the cops on me because I fit the description, because I always fit the description. Broadly speaking, America's foundational principle that black bodies are to be controlled, that they are both the source of profit and a target of fear and hatred, is still strong. We also still have the problem of some people who are not African American who feel that it is their place to tell African Americans the proper time, place, and manner to protest injustice. We have some African Americans who still feel that the solution for themselves personally or the race collectively is to avoid agitation, don't rock the boat, to avoid politics, or to take the other side, or to assimilate, to do your best to try to not remind people that you're even black at all. And finally, we have some people who don't know or don't agree that these things have even happened. And it's very hard to move on from the past when people don't even know what the past was or don't agree what it was. These problems have existed for a long time, and unfortunately, they're not going away anytime soon. This is our past, this is our present, and this is unfortunately our future. So then, what's the solution? What, again, I was asked to talk about sort of what's the future of the black community. The future of the black community is sitting in this church. The future of the black community is my son sitting there. It's the other young African Americans in this church. It's also the young white and Latin and Asian people sitting there today. The future of the black community is every young person in this church and every young person in this country. Let's look at that historically. Here's something else that you might be interested to know. Between March 1928 and November 1929, Martin Luther King, Frederick Reese, Robert Grace, Arthur E. Lucy, and James Earl Ray were all born. All of them within 16 months of each other, and all but one of them lived in central Alabama. When they were all young at the same time, in pretty much the same place, nobody but God knew that one of them was going to grow up to lead the Civil Rights Movement. Another one was also going to become a Black Baptist minister who would help organize the Montgomery Bus Boycott. That's, um, excuse me, that's Frederick Grease. Another one, the, the white one, was going to, the white, one of the white boys was going to grow up and become a Lutheran minister, Robert Grace, and help organize the Summer March. The black girl, Arthurine Lucy, was going to grow up to become the first black student at the University of Alabama. And the other white boy was going to grow up and hate the other one so much and what they stood for that he was going to assassinate one of them. These five babies, all born at the same time, and one of them grew up and killed one of the other ones because of what the other four stood for. Nobody but God knew how their futures were intertwined. Nobody but God knew how they were going to help shape the futures of so many other people for better and for worse. The future of the black community has and always will be shaped not only by African Americans, but by people of every background. So each of us has to decide individually and collectively and on an institutional of what that means. At the same time, it is also the responsibility of young African Americans to oppose other forms of injustice, to stand up when someone is being prejudiced on the basis of sexual orientation, to stand up against patriarchy and sexism, 
right? To stand against economic injustice and not to just say, oh, well, I'm black, I'm oppressed. Well, you can also be the oppressor. So all these things, in the same way that we're all intertwined regardless of race, we're all intertwined regardless of gender and orientation and religion and so forth. And so the future of the African American community is also African Americans standing up for people who are being held down in other ways. So again, we all have to decide individually and collectively what that means and what kind of future we want to have together. Thank you.